Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the June edition of the Law and Nature Dialogues hosted by the Centre for Environmental Law at Macquarie University. Um, today, well, Macquarie University um, is on the land of the Watamatagal people of the Darug Nation, and I pay my respects to elders past, present, and future. Today, we are very lucky to be hearing from Professor Margaret Davies. Uh, the title of uh, her talk today is Legality, Life, and the Normativity of Nature. I'll just give a bit of a bio uh, for Professor Davies before we proceed with um, today's uh, webinar. Margaret Davies is a research professor and Matthew Flinders Distinguished Professor of Law in the College of Business, Government and Law at Flinders University. She's the author of six books on legal theory, uh, the most recent being uh, Eco Law 2022, preceding that Law Unlimited in 2017. Professor Davies is a fellow of the Academy of Social Sciences in Australia and the Australian Academy of Law. Prof Professor Davies' contribution to environmental and ecological law are vast. In much of her work, Professor Davies has critically analyzed the influence of property law and theory in producing and limiting laws that can effectively respond to the ecological crisis. Related ideas, such as the image of the disembodied human, has carried through Professor Davies' scholarship and resonates strongly in her latest book, Eco Law. Today, we are fortunate to hear from Professor Davies about Eco Law. I'll just say a couple of quick things about it, and I'm sure Professor Davies will unpack these ideas uh, in a much more substantive fashion. Eco Law extends legal theory into the, the domain of the socio ecological. Conceptualizing law as a part of expansive materiality that all humans and non-human beings emerge from. The book endeavors to step outside the many discursive and mythological boundaries that have been placed around human organisms and human societies, especially in Western thought. The book therefore argues that there is a plural, plurality sorry, of norms, of potential normative worlds and normative fields across biological, geological, and social planes. I'll now pass over to Professor Davies uh, to speak on legality, life, and the normativity of nature. Thank you, Paul. And uh, yeah, it's great to be here um, talking about this today. I'm just going to share my screen. Has everyone got that? Um, so yes, thank you for the invitation. And uh, I'd like to uh, begin by acknowledging that I speak from the land of the Ghana people and uh, pay my respects to the Ghana elders, past, present and emerging. And I also in doing so, I'd like to acknowledge that First Nations legal thought has helped to show the way for my thinking in recent years, uh, in particular in my efforts to develop a concept of law that's more relational and connected to the earth than present models in Western thought. Um, so my talk today, as Paul said, is based on my uh, new book, Eco Law, which was published a little over a month ago by Routledge. And I'm going to start with what I see as the really big picture and progressively get more detailed as I proceed. And I'd begin uh, with the observation that it's often said, and uh, we've often heard it said that business as usual is not an option if the ecological emergencies that presently face the planet are to be addressed. My approach to legal philosophy and in particular, an ecological approach to legal theory is based on the notion that thinking as usual is also not an option. Uh, not only do we need new practices, but we also need new paradigms, new frameworks and a new language for understanding the place of human beings in the world. This means uh, at the most expansive scale, we need not only to change the laws that we have, but also change the way that law is understood. Western philosophy uh, is still based on the Cartesian division between body and mind, which is expressed at large as the division between the physical natural world and the exclusively human world of society and culture. Uh, Western law is also based on this model. By and large, those of us situated within a European and colonial tradition 
are educated to see law as a human creation that regulates other humans in our use of a natural world. The natural world is objectified and allocated by law, but it isn't itself part of the abstract system that Western thought calls law. The natural world has no active part to play in law, but is regarded only as an object in this scheme. Uh, and this clearly stands in contrast to how law is uh, often understood by Indigenous peoples. Within uh, European derived, derived philosophy and uh, a range of other disciplines, there's now a great deal of critique of the damaging effects of the division of nature from culture. Many commentators are endeavouring to transcend this division by engaging in an experimental reimagining of a non-divided world that places human beings within nature. Uh, this work is only beginning in legal philosophy and my book is a contribution to this effort. Uh, I see it as a long-term project, uh, re rethinking the paradigms, uh, obviously a very long-term project. It has nothing in particular that present academic discourse would define as impact. Uh, legal philosophical change uh, cannot itself be implemented, but it can coexist uh, with change that is impl implemented uh, in the short to medium term. So first, uh, by way of introduction, what do I mean by eco-law and where is it situated theoretically? Um, in a conventional sense, law uh, refers to a human tool for governing all things human and non-human. Um, by contrast, uh, eco-law in the way that I am defining that term is law that emerges from the matter of the world. And that distinction is critical. Uh, to explain it a little bit further, I would deploy a, um, a more usual or familiar notion of biopower. Uh, the philosopher Elizabeth Gross has explained in a recent interview that for Foucault, biopower regulates a body from the outside. So biopower is the normative regularities that are created by humans that, um, including the law, that regulate our bodies from the outside. And she points out that an alternative idea of biopower could refer to the powers that operate in and through living bodies. So Foucault said by, or thought of biopower as something from the outside, but you could also see it uh, as something that comes from the inside. And although he didn't use such a notion of biopower, Gross reads Foucault as suggesting that geopower is power that's embedded in the earth. She says, uh, rather than see geopower as the power that humans can extract from or hold over the geological, he sees geopower as the forces of the earth. So in both cases, there are two possibilities. Biopower could be the power of human law over the body, or it could be the power that's intrinsic to the body. And uh, geopower could be the power of humanity over the earth or the power that is intrinsic to the earth. Uh, with eco-law and the subcategories that I use uh, in the book of geo-law and bio-law, uh, I, I aim to make an aligned distinction. This term could refer to the limited domain of human law that governs the earth. However, I use it to refer to the unlimited domain of law that emerges from life and from the earth. Eco-law is law from the ground up that also includes human law as an eventual product. Uh, and in, do in doing so, the book connects legal theory with some of the science theory of recent decades, and in particular theory that has displaced deterministic mechanical laws with the more probabilistic laws that engage uh, agency, purpose, and constrained choice. Uh, also in keeping with my previous work, I don't make a firm distinction between law and the norm. Uh, what's known in Western legal theory as formal state-based law is emergent from, it's reliant upon, and ultimately it's blended into an extended field, field of norms in all of their plurality and materiality. 
In other words, there's a normative substratum that holds up any state-based law. It has no ground other than the norms of human society, which in turn are reliant upon the emergent processes of physical nature. Um, so there are a series of thoughts which frame uh, everything that I've said in the book. And I'll just, there's, about, there's five of these and they're explained at the, in the first, in the first part of the introduction of the book. Um, but they're kind of fundamental uh, to how I'm seeing things. Uh, the first is uh, this idea that comes from uh, the famous opening line of Robert Cover's 1983 article, Nomos and Narrative. He said, we inhabit a nomos, a normative universe. And the nomos is uh, simply a world made up of norms. So values, guides, behavioral patterns, habits, and laws. We're formed by and always situated within this milieu of norms. Cover elaborated his idea of the normative universe by reference to the interpretations of law that arise within a religious community. So closed societies inhabit a normative environment partly of their own making. But the idea of a nomos or world saturated with human made norms has become common in critical and socio-legal theory to refer to the way that norms surround us. They are localized to spaces, to particular social groups, to professions, to social media platforms. The norms of living are everywhere. Uh, second point is stepping outside the human, the nomos or normative universe is also apparent in nature and material processes. That is norms emerge from the movement and interactions of matter at cosmic and geological scales within life and across ecosystems. Uh, my image of the nomos therefore refers to the idea that nature, uh, a broad and a bit undescriptive term, um, but it's one that you know, uh, decided to use regardless of its philosophical um, difficulties, um, the idea is that nature, animals, plants, the earth, and so forth produces its own values and norms, and that human norms, including our legal systems, exist within this larger natural nomos. Uh, the third point is that the nomos is historical. Emergent normativity is contingent, yet stable, and therefore accumulative, or in social terms, um, historical, and constantly diversifying. For instance, the living norms that define us through evolution are path dependent, they build on the past and are therefore constrained by prior condition, uh, conditions, just as changes to human law always build on what already exists. So there's a historical element to all normative change. And this is one of the things um, that uh, constitutes a de departure from traditional natural law theory, which is, of course sees the natural law as unchanging and eternal as well as universal. Uh, so both of those elements can't exist when you actually um, place the nomos or the extended le the legality within um, the, the actual physical natural law, uh, natural world. Uh, the fourth point is that the um, that normalities and systems are plural, complex and intersecting. In short, they're entangled. There are a multitude of normative scales in life, uh, in knowledge, in state law, social norms in earth. Those parts of the normative universe are interconnected and layered, not separated into bits. Legal systems and other human legalities are embedded within this universe, not separate from it. Uh, and finally, whilst normativity is in one sense coexistent with order, that's how we normally see it, in fact, order and disorder are not distinct, but, but always co-implicated. Norms uh, and structure sometimes emerge from turbulence. The idea that uh, order emerges from disorder is one of the threads that connects the normativity of life to non-living normativity. Uh, and in the human sphere, uh, norms imply sameness, but also rely upon difference, just as order implies system, but relies upon uh, disorder or chaos. 
In summary, in summary there are five key thoughts. Uh, we inhabit a nomos. It emerges from matter and physical processes. It's historical and cumulative. It's plural and constantly diversifying. It rests on an interplay of order and disorder and say all sameness and difference. So broadly speaking, I use the term eco-law to denote this interconnected and plural nomos. To rephrase it in the simplest fashion, um, nature, by which I broadly mean the diverse nature of human and non-human worlds, produces and consists of norms. Norms are regularities that emerge from and promote sameness and convergence, but they also allow uh, and indeed are based upon the possibility of difference and divergence. They're constantly changing. Uh, law in all of its human forms is a specialized slice of this more generalized normativity. Uh, therefore, eco-law is not human law that governs the environment or ecosystems. It's not law for the Anthropocene or any system of legal, legal governance at all. It's an attempt to radically expand the referent of law so that it's no longer an exclusively human system or plurality of human systems, but unfolds with the, with the matter of the universe and more particularly of earth. Um, thus, rather than expand legal subjectivity to animals and other natural objects, I aim to position law and normativity in general as prior to the designation of subjects and objects. Everything becomes subject and object within plural normative relationships. Uh, human beings are both subject and object in different normative worlds. For instance, we're objects of a viral subjectivity even as we objectify viruses. So that's the broad picture. Um, and I had these all of these ideas in a fairly inchoate uh, and in, instinctual form, if you, if you might like to put it that way, um, for a few years, but I really had no idea how I was actually going to explain the mechanics of it because I felt it was really important to be able to not only make an image, but also explain how, um, how it actually worked or, or what, how to theorize um, law and normativity across those scales. Uh, and that's, I'm going to uh, give you some insight into that uh, now. <clears throat> um, this, this, and, and also speak about the uh, position of state law in relation to this image. So the story about law, nature and normativity that I present begins with order, disorder, decept, um, adaptive properties and emergent nature of earthly existing existence, living and non-living. Uh, in Western theory, as we know, the laws of nature and human law have often been regarded as radically different. Um, on the one hand, the law of nature has been seen as universal, deterministic and mechanical. And on the other hand, human law is seen as created intentionally and is dependent on circumstances. But those particular meanings of law are extremes. The state law on the one hand, where everything's done intentionally and created and the mechanical universe image on the other. Um, they're at the extremes. And in between, we see that human and non-human nature is more characteristically constituted by patterns that are normative in the sense that they're comprised of continually emerging norms, whether social or natural. Uh, so to recap, think, to think of nature as normative means that it consists of a multiplicity of values and patterns that emerge from its many intersecting and unfolding processes. And before continuing, I should perhaps make explicit that there are um, two ways of looking at the relationship. Now, there's probably lots of ways, but I've just selected two. Uh, looking at the relationship of our common positive understanding of law and natural normativity. And the first um, way of thinking about the relationship between state law and nature is to say that the idea or concept of a norm can be compared across human and non-human spheres. So <clears throat> what we think of as a norm or, or as law uh, can be analyzed uh, in broadly similar terms um, across both spheres. And, and the second point is, as I've said, that the material grounding of state law consists of the laws of, of the norms of nature. State law emerges out of a natural ground. 
And that might seem uh, to be an odd statement given that, as we know, state law is also created by parliaments and courts, but it's really just a reframing of human law as part of a larger normative world. It's the legal philosophy equivalent of saying that human life is part of nature and not separate from it. Uh, and I, I think that if we're going to, for me, if we're going to understand um, that broader uh, ecological context, then we have to start with the big picture and not with, um, not with state law. So I'm going to take those two steps in turn uh, and first uh, look at how I conceptualise the norm so it can be seen across human and non-human spheres. And second, to make a few more comments about how human law is part of the wider natural nomos. <clears throat> My working idea of norms, uh, both legal and non-legal, human and non-human, consists of three elements, um, that they're iterative, uh, connective, and purposive or teleologically, or, or teleological. So I'm going to go through those three points in turn. First, um, norms are the product of iteration or continued usage, things being done, thought, or spoken the same way repeatedly. They're always accompanied by the potential for difference. Norms are pathways created by usage or movement. They guide action, but don't mechanically determine it. There's always the possibility of divergence due to changing circumstances or changing environment. And in fact, a divergence that is subsequently found to work or to be adaptive may become a new norm. And I'm um, speaking deliberately in abstract terms that might apply to both the human and the non-human, uh, living and the non-living. Non in his uh, vast exposition of physical and social law, Order, the Self-Organising Universe, which was published in 1980 in English, astrophysicist um, Eric Jansch expressed the general principle of norm emergence applying across the physical world. He said, quote, the transformation of novelty into confirmation may be observed at all levels of the micro and macro evolution of life on Earth. Jansch often uses the term normalisation as a synonym for confirmation. Novel elements are introduced into a system, some of which are repeated and confirmed, leaving, leading to norms and normalised patterns. Because uh, such order emerges out of existing patterns and systems, it's necessarily temporal and historical. A norm might appear to be a singular thing at a point of time, but it's really an emergent force, uh, compressing all of the iterations that preceded it. Uh, the idea that norms arise from habits and customs is also embedded within the common law. In early centuries of its development, common law was regarded as emerging from usage since time immemorial or since time out of mind. The legitimacy of su such law was sometimes said to be based on this unremembered origin, but it was also understood to be based on solid social regularities and tried and tested behaviours. Similarly, beyond the formal law, social norms often, though perhaps not inevitably, emerge from regular behaviour and the imperative to behave normally. Repetition of a fact creates a norm or pattern which is a guide for behaviour. Um, like the common law, habitual behaviour may stabilise because it works towards a particular goal and or because it's efficient, a shortcut or a heuristic. For instance, pathways that are etched into the land because they're the most efficient way to reach a destination whether by a person or an animal, can also be seen as norms. They literally show the way to go in a philosophical uh, sense. This account of normativity is derived from the French uh, tradition of Canguillem, Foucault and Derrida, with an emphasis perhaps on Canguillem, in, in, uh, especially in chapter two of the book. Um, <clears throat> so that's the mechanism of repetition that I say is uh, creates norms. But the second point is that norms also arise from exchanges, entanglements and bonds between organisms, including humans, and between bits of matter. Norms are produced in relation, what's variously termed bonding, co-becoming, cooperation, contract, interaction and symbiosis. These relational activities involve 
merging and diverging entities that are connected in some way, exchanging resources such as nutrients, electrons, or DNA, communicating, forming structures, and reproducing. At the legal scale, a contract or treaty uh, forms a set of norms for the relationship between the parties. It may also make a new legal entity. Contractual norms uh, can emerge over time in a pattern of mutual behavior, or they can be intentionally agreed upon with a signing ritual, a handshake, or a simple quid, quid pro quo. An obligation can also be entirely one way, attached to a role or position, or emergent from actions. <clears throat> in Roman law, uh, as Scott Veach uh, reminds us in his recent book on obligations, uh, an obligation was a vinculum juris, a legal fetter, bond, chain, or rope, to quote Burks, uh, that tied the person with the obligation to the person they owed it to. I recommend that book for anyone interested in obligations. I found it most enlightening. <clears throat> so relationality as physical or metaphorical ties can be seen as constitutive of all law and the autonomous identities that inhabit it, and also of socio-political and cultural patterns and persona. At a scale of the norms of matter and of life, new norms um, are created, new norms created by relating are in constant production. If a seed lands in a healthy microbial soil, a pattern of material exchanges is quickly established between microbes, fungi, plants, and atmosphere. Symbiotic relations more generally enable and structure life at every stage from the formation of cells to entire ecosystems. Hence, uh, bonds constitute and differentiate. Uh, they mediate self and other and create obligations. And Karen Barad has even uh, utilized such language and terminology in uh, the context of electrons and other quantum things. She says, uh, entanglements are not a name for the interconnectedness of all being as one, but rather the specific material relations of the ongoing differentiating of the world. So at the atomic level, uh, it's a process of coming together and differentiation that, that is important. Uh, and interestingly, she says, entanglements are relations of obligation, being bound to the other, enfolded traces of othering. So to use the legal terminology, then norms, uh, both human and non-human, are basically customary and contractual. They're created by habits and by relations. And finally, uh, norms are aligned with and motivated by purposes, even, in, even if in many instances, the purpose is forgotten, minimal or buried. Purpose-driven action or action that follows a direction is normative and create norm it creates norms. Purpose or direction supplies value to action. The plant wants to grow towards the light. The animal wants to eat and survive. The virus wants to replicate. A somewhat qualified use of the term teleology captures this sense of uh, purpose or direction. To speak of teleology in this context doesn't imply motivation either by a beginning such as a creation or even an intention or an end such a, as a final or perfect condition, uh, nor does teleology imply singularity or linearity uh, in the way that it, <clears throat> I've taken it up. And I think there's quite a lot uh, of support for this in the literature. Teleology is simply direction in a, in a particular way, uh, direction for self-organization and self-preservation. Uh, having said that, the idea that nature has purpose has been quite controversial in certain fields of science that remain attached to the idea of a physical world that's essentially mechanical. But I think that it's almost a divergence in that, in that sense. So um, <clears throat> going back to uh, the second uh, point in the relationship between state law and the normative universe, I'll just say something now about the continuities and discontinuities between human laws and the normative universe. Right. Uh, so the first point is that the argument about the continuity of normativity across the differentiated spheres of the human and the non-human 
is in one sense straightforward. It simply involves a shift in orientation from a human-centric focus to a matter-centric focus, looking past the taxonomies that enforce the human uh, non-human divide necessi necessitates that we see that these spheres, while separable for some purposes, are nonetheless unified by matter and by the processes that shape it. There's no getting away from human dependence on the physical world, living and non-living, and since this is the case, an explanation of law that's confined to the human is only telling part of the story. But this isn't to say that state law and the norms of nature are the same thing. Uh, Georges Conguillem, whose work I uh, use frequently uh, in, the, in the book, distinguished human, human law from the vital norms of organisms quite sharply, arguing that the latter are imminent. Uh, this is a quotation from him. Um, <clears throat> nor vital normativity is imminent, present without being represented, acting with neither deliberation nor calculation. Uh, in other words, the normative pluralities that form an organism or a superorganism are not consciously chosen or followed. They emerge without reflection. Uh, <clears throat> human law, by contrast, can be identified, represented, intentionally followed or not, and reformed. That provides us with a workable distinction between the imminent norm and the representable norm. However, it's not so easily maintained in a material sense. The human, after all, is already uh, an assemblage of normative biological processes and is moreover not only a being, but a becoming, an ongoing process of constitution from quite different materials. Uh, in other words, the intersecting normative systems that constitute the nomos are complex. Externalized state-based law never escapes the imminent norms from which it's developed, whether these are at the quantum level, the cellular and microbial, the behavioral or the cultural. The interactions that produce norms are rarely linear. The intersecting normative systems of a complex ecology produce disruptions, detours and hybrid norms at every step of the way. Thus, it's never possible to reduce human culture, politics and legal deliberation to nature but nor is it possible to separate human beings and our natures from non-human natures. Plural normative systems form both continuities and discontinuities between normative matter and human meanings. I would say then that the pluralities of nor human normativity depend on a more basic biological normativity that exists well beyond the space occupied by the human being. Viruses regulate human beings more than the other way around. They have their norms <clears throat> as they are driven to replicate. They're constantly creating new norms and they do this according to established patterns. These viral norms are clearly not separate from human life and human norms, but rather interact with them uh, for better and worse. Looking uh, even further past biology to non-living processes, Ilya Prigogine said, uh, quote, human creativity and innovation can be understood as the amplification of laws of nature already present in physics or chemistry. Prigogine's uh, research in physical systems has allowed incredible depth and detail to be observed and understood in the continuities and connections between non-life and life and between human and non-human. So finally, <clears throat> um, I've just added an outline of the chapters here. I'll put them all up at once um, with a one line synopsis of the argument. It's a very obviously reduced synopsis, <laughs> but it gives you an idea of what each chapter says, basically. Um, the first is the introduction and basically what I've been speaking about today. The, the first chapter, first substantive chapter is an overview of the material by reference to slime mold as an object and subject of normative worlds. And then I'm going to uh, use that as a basis for exploring a few examples. The second chapter looks at um, the way that purpose has been understood in philosophy and to a, a lesser extent science philosophy, essentially post-enlightenment. Post uh, and it considers the rise of the idea that the net that nature is mechanical and the way this notion has been contested by 
evidence of natural normativity. The third chapter looks at the uh, biological side of natural normativity, in particular by reference to the ideas of Georges Canguilhem, um, <clears throat> but also some other biophilosophers of the early 20th century. Um, the fourth chapter expands the analysis to non-life, and this was perhaps the most difficult leap of imagination for me. But interestingly, I found many science theorists who argued in favor of non-living purposes. Um, the word purpose is perhaps a bit loaded to refer to a river or the spread of energy, but certainly uh, those flows have a direction. Um, the uh, Gaia theory or self-regulation of the earth as a multiplicity of non-producing systems is perhaps the most obvious example here, although I don't actually talk about it too much. Uh, and the fifth chapter is um, concerns putting it all in the context of human law and existing legal philosophy, for instance, in relation to natural law theory and the idea of state law. So I'll leave it now and um, uh, we can have some discussion and questions. Thank you for listening. Just have to get rid of my screen. Thank you, Professor Davies. Um, that was yeah, amazing, really. The, the insight into not just the, the normative, I think, breakdown, but also using Robert Cover as a means by which to, to understand the natural world. I mean, I would never have even considered that, um, to be honest, but um, here we are. Um, so <laughs> if anyone has any questions for Professor Davies, please um, put them through the chat box or alternatively, just put your hand up and I'll get to you um, yeah, when, you know, in, in a sort of, uh, in an order. Um, any questions off the bat for Professor Davies? Okay, well, if it's okay, um, I'll ask a question if that if that's okay. Um, yeah. Oh, sorry? Yeah, exactly. I was going to say Bron Bronwyn's got one, but I'd like. Oh, to sorry, Bronwyn. Bronwyn. Oh, okay. Sorry, I didn't. I'm. I'm just absorbing it. Thank you so much. I, I mean, it's it's a canvas <laughs> of. I I sort of have many reactions, and I'm not sure if I can articulate any of it as a question. But maybe maybe one is. Um. So I haven't not delved into the science that you obviously delved into, but I've become more aware of it through sort of almost like um reading beyond work just I, there's a fascinating i think appetite for popular communication about the the ways in which science has moved on from that mechanical um sort of uh linear causality etc and so and and i guess maybe my question is do you think that the science that the that the connection between the way science now understands nature to work and this view of law is actually almost as tight as that kind of reductive connection between positivism and a very mechanical sense of how science worked um, so that we could actually but 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 obviously completely confounding the human nature relationships at the same time but so that some of the objections that I, I, I don't know, that would, in a sense, almost, def it, it, it creates an extra layer of, uh, yeah, I don't know what the implications are. Maybe I'll just leave it at the question is, do you think that, that science has actually kind of swung round in a circle so that your conception of law is, is, is once again inconsistent with it in the way that positivism maybe was with a very reductive mechanical view of science, but now upturning all those assumptions? Mm. Yeah, right. Interesting. So, uh, and, and I guess positivism uh, you're suggesting was uh, consistent with a mechanical view of science because it did see the natural world as this passive thing that didn't, yeah. didn't, didn't act at all. Um, and, 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 I'm think, and I'm sort of implying a, a very uh, maybe social science inflicted idea of legislation as, you know, kind of driven by a scientific idea of how you get an impact from you know a particular law has impact x 
and you have a scientific theory behind that and mm. and, mm. and out you roll. Yeah. Mm. So, but uh, but I think the the premise the first the first premise is correct that science has moved hugely, uh, enormously, and mm. we st- in in the basic um, positivist legal thinking that is still the the foundation for the legal system. And so we obviously have to take that into account. It exists and it's what we use. But the the scientific thinking that that was based upon um, comes from the 17th century. Uh, And of course, it's gone through huge numbers of changes and variations since then. Um, And and the bifurcation of disciplines, you know, we have the huge bifurcation between the science disciplines and social science and humanities, and also an incapacity to even communicate because uh, it's also technical and difficult Mm -hmm. and we're not Mm -hmm. trained as scientists and it's kind of gone beyond what any what any human mind can comprehend. Um, So, so, so there are all of those problems, but I, I but in reading, you're right that there's a, a lot of um, science popularizations that um, that contest the mechanical uh, point of view, and they are based on um, uh, you know they're based on scientific experimentation and evidence uh, and thinking. Um, you know, uh, the the book written by Sting, um, Prigogine and Stengers in the 1980s, Order Out of Chaos. Was very much in this trajectory, and that, and they were writing about, um, you know, physics uh, essentially, and and the emergence of order out of turbulence, and it's quite extraordinary, you know, that, that it goes back a long way, um, that we've had this bifurcated view and an inability really to um, uh, think with scientists, and it's not that it's not that I would ever say that. I think we need to take science when we're doing legal philosophy or social science thinking that we need to um, adopt all of the uh, strategies uh, of science but or or the conclusions of science obviously we do in a policy sense but when we're using it to think with I see it as a more of a dialogue or an engagement um, and 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 a kind of bringing legal thinking into a different uh, field. But it doesn't mean that we need to suddenly uh, drop um, all, all of the critical theory that we've developed over, over many years, not at all. It's just a using or an engagement with science. But I do think that, and you know, increasingly scientists also are seeing the human scientific subject as part of that kind of uh, dialogue that from which knowledge emerges. So they're not necessarily seeing the world as objective in the way that um, we might once have um, seen them uh, as. Uh, I so, didn't get that. Could you try again? No, that's my watch talking to me. <laughs> so it always happens. Um, so, uh, so anyway, I think, I think it's clear that there's quite a lot of science theorists who are um, talking about a teleological or a purposive or directed universe and quite a lot of work that does take on the normativity of the natural world uh, in a way that, you know, I think it's, I think it's useful uh, for us. Um, and it's, un- it's uncovering what's already existent in Western legal theory. Now, obviously, a lot of this is known in different ways by First Nations uh, peoples. Um, but uh, my view has been that it's helpful for in order for you know Western theory to kind of come up to date and to be um, able to communicate properly and to be open epistemologically to First Nations knowledge, as we kind of need to shift our perspective a little bit as well. Thanks, Bronwyn. Um, I didn't want to invoke the chair's privilege too soon, so thank you Thanks. for the question. <laughs> Does anyone else have a question either I don't see anything in the chat box. Does anyone else have a question that they would like to ask Professor Davies at the moment? Okay, well, maybe I'll ask um, my question then. Um, So, Professor, talking about 
obviously the the broad uh topic uh norm and norm creation and looking at what you've described in this book and i, I believe in in previous work you've at least alluded to this uh the sort of materiality of norms um and and that in in terms of the formation of norms how then looking at the the western separation of law and nature how can law then um will play a role in this, if, if at all? And how does it take into account the sort of the unique role of, of humanity? And I'm sort of tying that unique role back to sort of, you know, the biopower ideas of, of Foucault and stuff that you mentioned earlier on. Um, so <clears throat> I'll take the second part uh, first, um, and then you can remind me of the first part because I find it difficult to, hold more than one thought in my mind at once, but how does, how does, um, how does the specific role of humanity, what, what does the specific, what role does the specific, um, sorry, uh, role of humanity play in all of this? Um, my, <clears throat> so I, I think that we have to, well, the way I would see it is that understanding that human beings are part of the broader natural world means that we also have to see that our knowledge is specifically human. Um, other species, other other kind of beings have knowledge as well that isn't human knowledge, um, and it, you know it's it's more or less sophisticated according to human norms. Um, but you know that, and a lot of animals know how to do things. Um, that I don't know how to do and will never know how to do. So there is a specificity to knowledge that comes from being human. And that is about our biological position in the world and about the way that we um, engage with the world. And that, so I, I think that the, the hum humanity is always going to be there. We can't step outside of our humanity or our, our species position in a sense, but that doesn't mean um, that it somehow, um, it, you know, to, to me that just cements the biological and the and the normative uh, and the place of knowledge as the kind of linking of the biological and normative as a as a kind of as a um, something that human beings create. So now, uh, can you remind me of the first part of your question? It was about law. Yeah, yeah. So it's sort of, um, I think you may have touched upon it already. It was about, um, yeah, how, how that role can be uh, facilitated in law. Uh, and particularly, I guess I was getting at um, the law and, and the formation of um, these material norms. I mean, does law have a role to play in this or, or, or not, you know, con conversely? Well, I think I think of law as the kind of endpoint of the material norms. So, so it's it's what is what emerges out of uh, material normativity. There is nothing uh, that is law that isn't material. It's just not possible to think of it. I mean, we do have this image of an abstract law or a set of norms that exists in the ideal space, but in actual fact, we we don't have access to those. All we have access to uh, the communications, the bodily interactions, the courtrooms, all of the spaces that law exists in and emerges from. So I would say that law is the final point. Um, but I guess in a, a kind of reverting uh, to a, the more conventional way of talking about it, how does state law, what we understand to be state law, what role does that have? Um, yeah, that's a difficult question and not one that I've set myself up to answer. I, th I think that there are other people, um, environmental lawyers, for instance, uh, who can assist with answering uh, those kinds of questions. But what I would say is that uh, I think the two things have to go, well, to me, the two things coexist. So nothing I, I do is actually um, contradictory of the, the ordinary everyday use of law in the way that we understand it, using that uh, as a tool because, uh, you know, it is still emergent from um, material normativity. It still is the end point of that. But I'd say also as, as a kind of 
standard or goal. Um, and in actual fact, there was an end point uh, to my talk that I didn't uh, get to because I thought I'd said enough and it was all quite complicated. Um, and it was just a little thought from um, Michelle Ceres. Uh, Oh yeah, so uh, Michelle Ceres says, well, clearly we are part of the human world and in, in, of the natural world. And in his book, The Natural Contact, Contact Tract, he talks about this. Um, and the, the thought, or what he says is we've got a choice. We can either, um, we can live with nature or we can uh, live against nature. As he says, we have the choice to be co-constituting symbionts or the kind of parasites that eventually kill their host. So that's a, a, a kind of one way of putting it that we're going to, we are kind of, a, a, including our law, are part of this um, larger system and we can devise laws that allow us to live with nature or we can, or we can not, um, we can kill our host, we can be parasites. Thanks, Professor. Um, we have a couple of questions I think now in the um, chat yeah so um, I'll just read them out and um, I'll then allow Professor Davies to answer the first one is from um, Rosamond um, it reads in your conception of geo law would it be necessary to define the character slash content slash source of that law in order to respond to or bring it into human law can you read that there Professor Mm, I can, okay, thank right, you. Cool. Yeah, it's helpful. Um, <clears throat> so, yeah, again, it's a really great question and one that I think that there, there are people who are more practically, I'm not very practically minded, um, and there are people who are much more practically minded than I am who would have ideas about that. And I think, for, for instance, the earth, the people who write about earth law um, and planetary planetary boundaries, for instance, would have uh, some way of saying that we bring the content of um, planetary boundaries, for instance, into human law. We understand that they are uh, the limits of uh, what human law should be permitting in terms of our engagement um, uh, with the earth. So that would be one way, I suppose, that that question uh, could be answered. But I, uh, I think that for me that that they they don't really have. Con I mean, they do have content or source because, but there it's always a, an emergence, always a change. And I think I'm trying to look at it from that larger perspective, um, uh, ra rather than thinking of it in uh, those immediate terms. But I think that there's lots of work which does kind of operationalize it. Um, in a way, even though it doesn't necessarily think about it in quite the ways I've been thinking about it. Um, thank you, uh, Professor. Um, does Rosamond, do you want to respond any to the Professor's um, response? Oh, I think you're on mute, Rosamond. I think oh, I think you're on mute. You are you are on mute. Yeah. I'm on mute. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Very sorry. Um, I've probably um, taken it up in a way that was not intended, but I just find the idea of um, uh, where was it? Uh, um, normativity um, emerging uh, without reflecting human law, which is, you know, a perfectly sensible idea, a necessary idea, I suppose. I'm just wondering how you really, I, you've given me one answer actually, um, but I was wondering how you, uh, if nature has its own laws which, and its own normativity um, and its own direction and character, generally speaking, how you know how to respond to it in mm. making human law law for humans to follow. Uh, yeah, and, and I think that's the question, isn't it? And, um, you know, um, we often hear 
uh, Aboriginal people say we need to listen um, rather than kind of um, put our own ideas onto nature. And, and But that's something that we're actually not particularly good at. So actually paying attention, I think, is the first step. I think that's uh, correct, that paying attention uh, and, um, you know, environmental lawyers talk about the precautionary principles. So, um, you know, not, not doing something if you don't know what damage is going to be caused. So finding out properly first, um, not that I'm an environmental lawyer, um, but, but, but still, it's a, that's the kind of idea. But I think paying attention and listening and just being open to those things. Now, the, the difficulty for Western law, of course, is that we've made things so complex and so removed from the natural world, so incredibly distant from the natural world. And so I suppose what I'm trying to facilitate in some abstract way is um, a, a, a bringing together um, of the discourses of law and the natural world and just being able to speak of the two things in the one sentence. Now, it's just a beginning and there are no clear cut answers, um, I don't think, but, but um, yeah, it's a, it's a really good question. Mm. In terms of geological time, obviously, it, well, it probably isn't so difficult to discern how things are meant to be from the natural world's point of view. Um, but uh, mm. it mm. seems to me that that, that um, categorization of normative nature in a sense, but including geological forces, um, does imply, well, being aware of uh, bringing in and waiting, I suppose, in some way, um, the importance of those sort of deeply embedded features in mm. normative nature into human law, which mm. To my mind, to my understanding, is one of the reasons for um, thinking about that as, a, as one big element of mm. material mm. that uh, human environment mm. deals with. Mm. Yeah, I think we, I think we have to think that big. Absolutely. Mm. Mm. Yep. Uh, thanks, so, Rosamond. Um, sorry, I might just have to. Um, we're running a bit short on time. So um, I don't want to keep Professor Davies much too much longer. Um, so there are two questions in the chat, and I've just quickly read across them from Margaret Young and then Kath Wallace. Um, and Professor Davies, they are kind of similar. I think they're both sort of asking um, in, in a very sort of basic sense, of course, I don't mean to, 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 to reduce them to the same question, but they are both asking, I think, about the application of uh, your work to, to the international law context. Um, so perhaps, um, Professor Davies, you could respond to those two questions. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, yeah, th thanks. I mean, they're really good questions. And yes, I do think that it applies equally to uh, international law as, as well as domestic law. I mean, they, they're kind of humanly made um, constructions which are based, you know, ultimately on um, material normativity going down through society and into uh, the physical world. Um, how they, how they, uh, would make a difference or could make a difference. Yeah, I'm, a, I'm afraid this is where I um, have to revert to what, what I've already said, which is that they really just encourage us to change our perspective a little bit. So of course those negotiations um, are, are going to go on within the framework that they're set up. But I think it's, you know, to me, really worthwhile just to step outside uh, and think about, um, think about the bigger picture, to think about the fact that we are actually um, biological bodies uh, that are reliant on a whole range of, um, of other things and that law is just one little slice of that. Um, 
so so just to sit to step outside and to kind of I know that people who engage in those negotiations are acutely aware of that, but but I but I think for for um, me as a legal philosopher uh, <clears throat> and just in terms of thinking about the position of law, um, just that just having that consciousness that the law is just one part of a natural world, not um, separate from it, is an important uh, important thing to. Keep in mind. Excellent, thank you. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining um, uh, the final Law and Nature Dialogues for um, session one. Well, I suppose the Australian or New South Wales session one for 2022. Um, really great way to sign off, and and I hope um, from this discussion you all go out and buy. Uh, Professor Davies' book, <laughs> Eco Law, um, and and I think you know substantiate um, your your learning further. Um, thank you again, Professor Davies, for for um, your your talk. Um, yeah, I think everyone here just just looking at the comments here. I mean, people were sort of a little um, a little bit sort of uh, disappointed that they had to go and I think take care of other commitments. They would have rather stayed around. So um, thank you, everyone, again for joining. I'm going to bring the uh, webinar to a close now, and um, we hope to see you all soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Paul.